Moscow, get a seat in the front as well. There's a seat over here. Thank you very much indeed. And can we move on to call the next speaker? And the next person on my list I'm going to call on is Sagi Hussain, the board director of Case Business. Sagi. Now, 
the criteria or the, uh, the balance of proof required in order to fulfill that. It's very difficult for us. And that's what the bar barrister said in the court the other day. So when we hit a target, we don't know what we're aiming at. We don't know what's being said about Mahdi that we can challenge, present evidence to contradict that. So therefore, it's an extremely difficult situation. And most of these sister deputation cases end up being lost because SIAC judges have very limited power in order to go beyond things. Nevertheless, the appeal will continue. The fight, the legal <coughs> fight, uh, will continue. Because really, um, we have to accept <coughs> that over the last 10 years, the position as far as the legal protection or the laws that apply, if I may say, I mean, I know our friend from the Kurdish community was here, and there are people here from the Tamil community and other refugee communities who are um, also being made victim uh, of this. It's largely geared towards the Muslim community. And if you look at the terrorism legislation from 2000 onwards, to the issues where if a, a Muslim is owning their CDs, uh, if a Muslim is wanted by America, um, and if a Muslim is accused of extremism, as in the case of Mehdi Hashi and, other, and a few others, there's very little opportunity provided to the defence teams, to the appellant teams, to actually prepare a proper case and proper evidence to challenge that. And one of the biggest hindrances, and unfortunately it's about to be institutionalised if the Secret Justice Bill becomes law shortly, is the issue of secret evidence. And this secret evidence, um, most people have left it and accepted whatever the government says. But slowly, um, its most informed uh, commentators are beginning to realise that this secret evidence actually <coughs> is a cover for incompetence, corruption and outright dishonesty. This is the basis upon which people's lives are being messed around with, whole family lives are being disrupted. And this is why, apart from other things, I will sort of urge everybody to look at the full implications of the Secret Justice Bill, what that may mean. Now, as far as the activities of the Security Services are concerned, there are two situations where the young Muslims like my and his friends, and now the Kurdish community and people from the Tamil community are being <coughs> intimidated and harassed. And that is on the streets, where people are just going about their normal life, and suddenly three or four people, uh, cars or um, unmarked cars will just stop, push those people into a corner and start intimidating them and harassing them. That has actually happened to a few of my clients, who subsequently found me so difficult to move about everyday life in London, in England, but they left the country. Now there's that situation. The other situation, of course, the well-known one, is the Schedule 7 stops at the airports and ports. Those Schedule 7 stops are not only discriminatory, they mostly profile your colour, and uh, we'd say, it was going to say, but uh, well, a lot of Muslims are not uh, white, but nevertheless, has to be said, the majority of the victims are people of a particular colour. And I'm waiting for the time when I'm stopped properly by a Schedule 7 officer to ask him whether he's proud to go and tell his children that his day job is stopping people on the basis of their colour. Um, that hasn't happened to me yet, but although um, it nearly happened, um, it happened after I did um, a short tour of the United States, incidentally. I went round about six or seven different states talking about um, the terrorism uh, legislation and the impact of the war on terror policies. And there's a particular case for Lafayette Siddiqui that I was uh, working on. And ironically, I didn't have any problems at all in any of the ports in America and in the airports. Um, but when I came to London, this very nice Asian looking, um, Asian is quite relevant here. I will say that Asian-looking uh, lady standing at the uh, uh, port uh, at the impossible control 
Um, I'm, incidentally, I'm, I'm in a plane uh, from New York. The majority of people are New Yorkers, Americans, or people who've been to um, from London, London, there, and there for the weekends, for shopping, etc. So I remember having a very good fun at the back of the airport, uh, a plane with lots of people from different colours and different backgrounds. We just uh, generally chit chat about travels and culture and all the things you do. And I was the only person in the whole queue, I was suddenly told to move away and go and sit down. And it's the first time it's ever happened to me and I could see how humiliating it must be to be singled out uh, and, and be told to just move away from that um, line and make yourself visible. Fortunately for me, that uh, those uh, fellow passengers who I was talking to uh, during the flight actually started raising eyebrows and started asking questions, which were quite clear to the, uh, to the lady uh, behind the desk, but more importantly, her supervisor, um, who was standing on her shoulder, uh, that this is not going to be an easy, uh, uh, easy situation. So lo and behold, um, I was um, no longer asked to uh, stand aside, join the queue, I was allowed to go. Um, that's my, uh, my main experience here uh, at that, but many of the people who are not so fortunate, their stay in this country uh, may not be that uh, permanent. Their, um, their own level of confidence or friendships or their community ties may not be that permanent, so therefore we're far more vulnerable. So we have a situation, and if I may, uh, I'll conclude. We have a situation where it's now become the norm that Muslims, and other minority communities are now being stopped regularly, are being harassed, and those who get intimidated enough, like Matthew, go abroad, have their citizenship revoked, in circumstances which make it for them very, very difficult to even appeal, get that access to justice, fight the case, and we have, in many as we've seen, um, appear to be, and we're still working on this, I'm investigating further on this one, appear to be a collaboration between UK state uh, agencies and the American intelligence agencies to time his declaration so that when he is picked up, when those people on his near agents or whatever turn up, by that time he's no longer a UK, uh, UK citizen and the Britain can say, well, we've got nothing to do with it. And I will just leave with one uh, final remark that Theresa May or others may actually say uh, they are no longer British citizens. But there are plenty of public opinion in this country. Uh, plenty. And you'd be surprised how many people are waking up and recognizing that the ethnic minorities and communities have just been used as a bogey figures for the state agencies to get more and more powers. Those more and more powers are going to be widely used. So unless we work together to stop those abuse and use of those powers, we're going to have a very dangerous security state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. Two friends on the standing there. There's still some seats around if you don't mind coming sit there. Before I go to the next speaker. There are seats. There's one over here. There's two over there. Three seats here. Uh, three seats over here. Come in. Come in. seats. No, I'm yeah. sure. I'm assuming you want to sit down. <laughs> yeah, you're going well to do so. Okay, the next person on the list is Mohammed Noor from a community worker with KTC Hall. Same person. Yes. You want to speak differently? Yeah, good. Sorry. <laughs>
Um, coming back from Dubai, um, I was slightly uh, a few steps behind my mother and my little brother. When uh, a plain clothes police officer was standing just outside the, the plain door, <coughs> and what he said to me was, excuse me sir, can I speak to you for a few minutes? At the time I was uh, around 19, maybe 20 years old. And I said, all right, sure. And he says, where, where are you coming from? I said, Dubai. And then he said to me, any chance you just went into Iraq? I was like, Iraq? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then my mother just realized, she's, uh, um, where's my hand? And she, she turned around, she sees this officer with me. She's like, what are you doing with my son? The officer just realized that I was with my, my mother and said, and he backed up and said, no, no, sorry, you can go. And so that was my first experience with um, uh, being stopped in uh, airports. And this was probably my second trip abroad. Fast forward to around 2007 um, <coughs> or so, 2007, um, started to realize from, from, from the Kinshan community organization, one by one, uh, some of the workers would be targeted. Um, and uh, uh, one, one, of, one, of the, one of the guys were, were um, brave enough to, and, uh, to, tell, to tell our chairman. And the chairman asked, has this happened to anyone else? And then, lo and behold, one person said, yeah, it's happened to me, the other one. And then we realized, because we didn't tell each other, we didn't, nobody told each other what, what was going on. Everyone was just scared, oh, I'm being targeted here, I better keep my mouth shut. <coughs> and then I, I realized that all of this is happening to everyone, and I'm thinking, it's happened, it hasn't happened to me. How come? It's not fair. How come it's happening to you? Uh, unfortunately, I shouldn't have spoke like that because the next morning I get a knock on my door, um, and I'm pretending to be a postman. Uh, and I'm thinking, what, what about all it from Amazon this time? And uh, then he flashes me some. Uh, I found out later on it was a, a fake cowboy badge um, with a star on it because I've never seen a police police badge before. Uh, and then gained access to my to my house with an MI5 agent. Um, and both were keen to recruit me uh, as an informant or, or whatever they wanted. So I, when I flatly refused, they said we'll be in touch, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. And I was like, you can be in touch as long as, uh, as many times as you want, the answer will be no. <coughs> um, then we realized, um, as we try and travel abroad, we get stopped here and there. Get um, questioned. Um, my last, my last trip, I went, I went, I, I did go to Somalia with my father and my and my younger brother. I mean, sorry, my older brother. On my way back, I came by myself. I went with those two. They stayed behind. I came back by myself because I had work commitments. Lo and behold, I get stopped, and they told me, "Yeah, I've got, I've got to give them my DNA now." When I refused, I said, "For what? You know, take my DNA?" They, they said. Um, Sorry, we just got to take your DNA. When I refused, they took me to the police station in Heathrow, um, tried to get permission from their superintendent. When they finally got permission, um, they took the DNA, but still held me for uh, roughly nine hours. Um, and when I we got to bond uh, this police officer, and he was like, you know what? I don't really know why they're stopping you. Well, we've been instructed to stop any Muslim and then, he, and he, then he started talking about some 60 year old Muslim guy he stopped, he's coming back from Hajj to take his DNA and said this is, this is the instruction we've got and I know uh, I shouldn't be saying it but this is it and, and when I complained about the situation he, he basically um, denied, denied saying it and even though there were recording devices in the, in the room at the time they flat out said uh, it wasn't working at the time <coughs> Coming back to our work at KTC, we work with a lot of uh, youth, uh, some of them are Muslim, and now we're, get, we're getting young children coming up to us, or young, young men coming up to us, expressing, uh, how can I put it, expressing their, their very disillusioned with what's going on at the moment. There was one guy who spoke to us, he, he, he called me and, um, and shared with love, and spoke to us, for roughly three hours, crying his, crying his eyes out, literally crying, just saying, I don't know what to do, I'm being targeted, I'm 
being stalked and being harassed. I don't know what to do. Should I just give up and work for it? And um, <coughs> this is what's gonna, this is what's happening now. With the case of Mahdi, now you're seeing that his citizenship is being revoked. Now this put more spies into the mix. Uh, so now you're now now young children, young men, young women are asking. If I show any form of political um, activism, I might have my citizenship revoked while being abroad somewhere. Maybe going to Hajj, doing, uh, doing your Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, come back, and uh, stop that at Saudi and say, you know what, you're going to be deported back to your home country because you're no longer uh, a British citizen. And um, Alhamdulillah. Uh, our cases have been have been brought up with cage prisoners. So when cage prisoners started helping us out, I started doing a bit of research as well. Uh, since September 11th, but, um, I mean, the first people to be targeted were probably Muslims with, with no no British uh, uh, citizenship or no British uh, nationality. And now it's, it's kind of jumped to um, neutralised British citizens, and then I'm guessing it's going to jump to don't care where you was born, you can have your citizenship revoked and then eventually it can be happening to a white middle class person shows descent. This is the track that I'm thinking is going. <coughs> the implications it has, these, these policies, the implications it has is number one, distrust. None of the youth now trust a police officer. Uh, no one respects uh, a police officer. Um, with the Ibrahim Magad case, uh, uh, after he went missing, I uh, police come after me, um, knocked on my door on a Sunday morning and said, do you know where he is? And I'm like, what? I didn't even know he was missing. It was, it, it, it was like, um, so I told him, yeah, if I hear anything, I'll, I'll, I'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll inform you lot. A week later, they come to my workplace, ask me the same questions again. And I'm like, guys, what are you doing? You're harassing me now. Uh, nothing has changed. It was just literally four or five days later. And I'm like, nothing's changed. Two new officers. I'm like, you guys don't talk to each other a while. I've told your officers I don't know nothing about it in the guy's case. Nor do I know where he is. Nor do I know what he's up to. Why are you harassing me? And uh, incidentally, um, Sheikh Hadil ha happened to be there. So um, they didn't stay for long. All they did was leave me a, a piece of paper framing me if I do have information on these photographs and I don't come forward with it, I could be liable in the future. <coughs> and I say, um, <coughs> last thing I would like to say is um, the question how can we make these things right? Um, probably to, to society as a whole in Britain. Um, some people might be thinking, yeah, this is a, a Muslim problem, uh, but I doubt that this will end with the Muslims. I mean, it, it, um, as, as Sir Lil was saying, said, these powers are, are slowly being used on the wider community. Um, it's, it's, it's probably, we're probably used as, as, as the excuse, as the guinea pigs, um, to test out these, these laws. And it's, I still can't get my head around the secret evidence, though. This is like, this is, this is worse. I mean, can you imagine now, me, I've, I've got three daughters, and I, and, I, and I saw one of them, let's say I saw one of them do something wrong, and, and, and I picked her up, I said, look, you're being punished. She's like, for what? And I'm not going to tell you. Secret. I mean, a child would be like, that's not fair. A child would recognize that's injustice. I mean, and, and, and we're here accepting this secret evidence nonsense. Um, and it's, it's really, really silly, a shame on us that we, we should accept such silly, silly um, laws, secret evidence. I still, to be honest, I still can't get my head around a secret. What's so secret about it? Tell me what I've done wrong, and I'll defend myself in court. If not, then you, if, if you have no evidence or if you want to keep it a secret, keep it a secret to yourself and don't try and harass me about it. That's all. Thank you.
very mindful of time, and we've got two more speakers to take, and I think at least we'll have half enough discussion because we want to listen to the audience as well. So, can I call on Kate Craig, please, from Holding Society of Social Employees, come and speak. Justice for Matthew and to fight. 
fight for justice for all of those people uh, who have been the victims of harassment and abuse by the British state. And I hope that after this meeting tonight we can continue to talk and continue to work together to that end. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the last speaker is going to be just to sum up.